right now, it is time to check in with none other than the leader of the opposition and the People's National Party, Mr. Mark Golding. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Greetings. Hi there. Hi, Kalina. Lovely it's to be really with you. good. It's really good to have you on. This interview has been a couple months in the making, but we're glad that we're able to make it work now. Yeah, me too. So I'm going to start with a somewhat general question, right? How mm -hmm. would you describe the state of the Jamaican economy right now? The Jamaican economy has achieved a certain maturity in terms of our macro fiscal um, situation. We have, <clears throat> over the last decade, through the efforts of successive governments, been able to bring our public debt uh, substantially under control and reduce it to much closer to what is regarded internationally as a sustainable level relative to the size of the economy, GDP. So that has been a very important achievement. And, you know, it was achieved through significant discipline, fiscal discipline over the decade. And uh, the rules that have been written into our law to ensure that governments adhere to uh, uh, prudent fiscal policies, has, those rules have, which are generally referred to as the fiscal rules, have borne fruit in the sense of ensuring that um, governments stay on track to achieve a more sustainable debt level, which is very important because that enables more resources to be available to do other things, uh, very important things like looking after the infrastructure of the country, looking after important services such as health services, education, etc. So from a macro fiscal point of view, things are, I would say, you know, fairly stable and there's not much to be uh, worried about in that regard. However, in terms of how people feel about living here and the experience they have uh, living in Jamaica, it's a different picture. Uh, but for for <clears throat> those who are relatively privileged and well off, life is comfortable, no doubt. But for a lot of Jamaicans, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because the hospitals uh, are really not looking after um, persons who come there in a way which allows them to feel that they are treated with dignity. When they need a hospital bed, they often have to wait a very long time. They often have to wait on a bench, sometimes for days, or on a even lying on the, on the floor in a wheelchair when they should be admitted and in a bed. In terms of the education system, we have serious problems which have been studied and documented. We have the problem of you know, primary school children, a large percentage of them, over 30 percent, leaving primary school unable to read and write and do basic arithmetic. And that, of course, results in those children typically having very challenging years through secondary school, poor outcomes. Sometimes they leave with no subjects. And that feeds into the disaffection and the stymied opportunities for those young people. And that, of course, feeds into the crime and violence problem, which remains a very serious problem in the country. It's a huge drain on our economic growth and our wealth creation. And it also saps hope and makes living in Jamaica a fearful experience for many. So although the economy on the face of it and from a you know credit rating agency's perspective, is um, robust in the sense that you know our reserves are strong our, we've been running you know tidy shit from a budgetary perspective for a year etc that is not really reflecting in the hopes and dreams the aspirations of our people being realized and i think that's a great developmental challenge that jamaica faces now is how do we translate the statistical gains the accounting gains the the you know public uh, financial gains that have been realized how do we translate that into really improving the quality of life of the majority of our people and making a less unequal society a society which is more cohesive from a social perspective where all jamaicans feel part of it you know for many jamaicans their aspirations are to leave jamaica and to try and make a living a better life for themselves and their families abroad Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, you know, obviously not an ideal situation for a country that is a proud nation, a country which has delivered to the world such popular culture 
and has this brand which we're all proud of you know th through our music our creative industries our sports prowess etc but we still so haven't got you, it right so what would you do differently from the mm -hmm. current administration to improve the economy and to improve some of these issues that you mentioned just now we can't talk about all of them just yet because you mentioned a lot no. crime education health care but specifically mm -hmm. on the economy what would you and your party do differently well i think it is important to uh continue the trajectory of reducing the public debt and achieving debt sustainability it's written into our law and it is something which we put a lot of sacrifice as a nation into getting to where we are. You know, when we entered into the IMF program in 2013, our debt to GDP ratio was 147%. And that was way out of whack. That had accumulated rapidly in the previous years and needed to be addressed for the long-term future of the country. As I've said, great strides have been made bringing that down somewhere in the 80 odd percent region now and that is a very good thing and we are committing to taking it to 60 percent which is the statutory target that's built into the fiscal rules um but uh, go ahead but having said that there is much more fiscal space now for policy options so we are very interested in focusing on the problems of the primary school system and that major gap that I identified earlier as to, you know, such a large percentage of our school children not getting the basics by the time they leave primary school. That has to be fixed. And that means more focus on the causes of the poor performance in primary schools, ensuring that teachers are well paid, that the teacher training system is adequate for the needs of the of the school system and that the schools themselves are um especially the ones that are underperforming are given the necessary attention to bring them up to scratch that's a major plank for us the training system in the country also i think is underperforming for many years under the current administration hart which is a state trading agency didn't actually have a functional board so students who went through heart programs couldn't have their certificates signed, which meant that it was a very frustrating process for them. We need to look at our training system and I think have much more private sector input into that because mm -hmm. there are a number of companies in Jamaica that run excellent training programs internally. They call themselves, you know, universities often, but they're training for the jobs that they have and that are coming downstream through the investments that they're making and i think we need to really incentivize those those companies that are capable of expanding their training to do so and uh, you know work in tandem with heart and the state training apparatus so that we're developing skills in our people that can service high value added investment and br build our national productivity which is the ultimate um way that we can create greater wealth and grow our economy so that's another area of focus for me in terms of tertiary education the national productivity absolutely important yeah. but i think right. mr mm -hmm. golding probably issue number one on the econ on the economic front for jamaicans right now is inflation the cost of living in the yeah. past year things have gotten dramatically more expensive and mm -hmm. We don't know how to, a lot of people just don't know how to cope with the dramatic increase in the cost of living. So how do we address this? Yeah, well, I had said from 2021, when it was clear that the bottom had fallen out of the economy because of COVID, that the government should do more to cushion the crisis on the people. And I had suggested that the direct expenditure for making life more tolerable, more bearable, more survivable for pe people who need that kind of help be increased to 2% of GDP, which at that time was roughly $40 billion per year. The government didn't do that. Uh, they did something, but it was much less comprehensive than we thought was necessary. And with the inflation that has come after the pandemic, 
partly because of the geopolitical problems in the Ukraine and Russia now in the Middle East, but also because of the supply chain ch challenges that arose during the pandemic and which have continued to be problematic. The cost of living has really risen on people. And that, I think, requires a significant response. There can be a response through tax measures uh, to relieve persons of some of the tax burden that they bear, especially lower income earners. And also there can be consideration for increasing the targeted um, relief that is given to persons who are on the edge of survival and you know, through PATH and so on. So that is, a, of course, one has to carve up the, the pie, so to speak, in the best way that one can. And growing the economy which generates a bigger pie and, be, and creates greater resources for looking after people who need that kind of help. But in principle, we feel that the government needs to maximize at, the, at this time anyway, and when people are really ravaged by inflation and where, although the unemployment number is low officially, the reality is that when you poll, you know, polls show that uh, unemployment remains a, a significant factor of concern for people. And that is because the way in which unemployment is measured in Jamaica involves, includes persons in the employed category who are really marginally employed. They may be employed one hour a week, you know, so they're temporary, they're living hand to mouth. They may not be engaged in what you'd call formal jobs with benefits and so on. And they, they may be are earning- people who, mm -hmm. Are people who are unemployed employable? Because on the one hand, we hear people saying we're looking for jobs, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, you hear uh, people from the productive sector, the manufacturers, the employers saying, we can't find people with the requisite skills to employ, and we need mm -hmm. to possibly look overseas. I've heard that call, and um, I am reluctant to accept a need to employ labor from abroad, uh, given that we have 720 odd thousand Jamaicans over the age of 14 who are um, not in the labor force and uh, who are outside of the labor force. Some of those are students, some of those are elderly persons, but several hundred thousand of them are in the adult cohort that ought to be employed. Now, how do you get those persons into the workforce? Again, it's a question of your training system. You need to have, for example, a much more aggressive approach towards certifying skilled persons who uh, who may not have had the benefit for one reason or another of getting certification, but who do have skills. And we have a lot of tradesmen in this country who fall into that category. And there are others who can be trained uh, to learn the necessary skills to be part of the employed system, and but it may take some investment to, to achieve that. Uh, so, training also you know, takes some time. Training is not immediate. It will time. take it takes time. possibly years for those people to complete their training and be ready to do the jobs that are available. That people that depending need. depending on the nature of the jobs, it may be a, a question of months. It may be a question of more than months, maybe years. But you know that there are also possibilities of learn on the job training as well. So persons can be employed while they're learning. But you know, one has to do what one can. And this is obviously a way in which you can achieve this is by trying to bring more of the persons who are outside the workforce into the workforce. And that is a, a critical thing for the country because while you have such large numbers who are outside the workforce, you know, many of them are engaged in other types of activity too, which are undesirable as we know, because we have a problem with a lot of illegal activity, which is itself creating problems for the society. So we really need to focus on trying to bring people into the workforce, into the legitimate system, so they can have proper jobs where they have proper benefits, not contract labor, where they're deprived of basic benefits and so on, but proper employment. And for that, skills training is absolutely vital. Another big issue for Jamaicans is housing. So I'm taking my first question from the audience. Kim Loy Champagny wants to know, what are the plans for affordable housing? It's a good question. We have seen a construction boom in the country fueled by low real interest rates uh, prior to the uh, recent inflation um, problem, which has resulted in an adjustment to monetary policy. But for a period of a few years, there were very low interest rates uh, in Jamaica relative to inflation. And 
there was also a tax break given to developers essentially by lowering the cost of transfers in around the, go the government take tax applicable to transfers but that, what happened though was that the developers focused in that segment of the market where there is you know better returns for them which one ex you know understands that's what business people do but the problem with it is that there is a very underserved segment which is you know first time home owners in fixed income jobs in the civil service in the public service or indeed you know in small businesses who have not yet really accumulated the kind of capital that would enable them to buy a home that is you know 30 million dollars 25 million dollars very the, the lower the lower income housing segment has been largely ignored or an underserved for some time and we need to get back into serving that so that people can start on the, you know the home owning ladder and over time people can improve those homes and they can expand or they can move upgrade or move into sell and move into a, a, you know a more expensive home as they become wealthier but getting those homes built is important the national housing trust has been denuded of resources for a long time for 10 years now the government has been and that started with us when we were facing a crisis a fiscal crisis with a debt to gdp ratio of 147 percent which we inherited when we came into office in 2012 and that you know as part of getting that under control we had to run a very high primary surplus seven and a half percent of gdp and to square that circle so to speak we needed to take some resources out of the surplus that had built up in the national housing trust and we passed a law to enable that to be done for four years at the time we were criticized heavily by the opposition uh, and in fact they even had a civil society group close to them took the matter to court but lost what then happened is when they came to power in 2016 they not just once but twice passed laws extending that um extraction of resources on an annual basis even after the imf agreement had come to an end and it's still going on now so the nht is being stripped of 11.4 billion dollars a year to help fund the budget so when the government talks about no new taxes bear in mind that one of the ways in which that is achieved is by stripping the housing trust of 11.4 billion dollars a year and that has really meant that the housing trust is not paying playing the role that it was envisaged as a catalyst for housing for the working class in the country and that is a problem for, for us so we are committed to ending that um, annual extraction of resources from the National Housing Trust. Oh, and no, but, but how would you end that, given that that is one of the measures by which we fulfill the, our debt trajectory? And you have already said, mm -hmm. been on record, saying that we need to continue the trajectory that we're on. Bear in mind, Kalila, that for the last few years, mm -hmm. because of the reforms that were implemented in the tax system, starting in 2013 and continuing for the next three or four years which have borne significant fruit the government's tax revenue has overperformed each fiscal year by leaps and bounds by approximately a hundred billion dollars a year so they end up at the end of the fiscal year collecting revenue from the economy more than a hundred or roughly a hundred billion more than they had budgeted at the beginning of the year and we feel that those surpluses are what you're really talking about in terms of how you spend those monies. And I think that given that there's a housing crisis, especially for low income persons or for persons seeking to get into the housing market for the first time, you have to empower the housing trust with the resources it needs. And that really means stop it, taking that money out of the housing trust each year. That's one important way you can do it. As it stands now, the housing trust is having to, as it were, outsource lending to its contributors, to the private market. And the way it's doing that is that it's subsidizing the interest rate that the private lending market is providing to its contributors. And that's costing the housing trust going forward significant resources as well, which is going to mm. further undermine its solvency. So these are this is a problematic situation that the government has created in relation to the NHT over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. When we imp implemented that for four years, we got an opinion from a top five audit firm that said that we could extract those resources without compromising the business plan of the NHT. But when it was extended after that period and has gone on and on year after year, it has had a very serious impact on the National Housing Trust.
So you're saying the government's current revenues have the ability to absorb that and just eliminate that extraction? I, that's right. I believe that is the case. And it's a question, for example, of how you handle other things, how, you know, what kind of capital expenditure you're focusing on. The government has focused on, for example, a number of major public works projects, road projects and so on that have used up significant resources. The Montego Bay Bypass Project is being funded entirely out of the budget. There's no debt that's been taken on to build that and so on. So there's a, it's all about prioritizing what you think are, needs to be done now to get the economy moving forward. We feel that capital expenditures are important, but they should not be at the at the expense of social expenditures that can help to make the economy more efficient and that can help to make um, the country more productive and can also create um, a better social environment in which investors feel that they should invest. So let, so me, just, let me just see if I'm understanding you correctly. Are you yeah. saying that roadworks such as the Montego Bay Bypass, major projects like that, the St. Thomas Highway, those are less important than, like you said, social expenditures? And is it that the policy would be that you would pause or slow down some of these major works that are currently being undertaken and use that use those funds for social uh, expenditure social expenses i believe that housing low income housing is a very important uh, need at this time and the infrastructure for the for the settlements informal settlements that we need to be formalized people need to be given tenure they need to have infrastructure so they can build homes and create wealth for themselves i think those things are very important i wouldn't discontinue or stop any project that is already on the underway that would not make sense but looking forward i think that we need to focus much more on the things I've been talking about. And in terms of roadworks, we need to look, I think, spend more on road maintenance and ensuring that the roads that people drive on every day to get in and out of their homes are in a decent condition. They are in a deplorable situation now. So I am less interested in major road projects going forward and more interested in ensuring that the road network that we have is functionally usable without damaging people's cars and so that you know you have less expense to the motorist um and and commuters in general from bad roads but also um focusing as you, you asked me about housing and i said yes housing needs some attention and eliminating so, the extraction of resources from the housing trust is an important part of that so would the position be for the government to subsidize uh low-income housing because you're saying that you know if we're not taking the 11.5 billion from the nht but then also on the other hand if we have like the private sector currently doesn't seem incentivized to build low-income housing because they're going after the luxury markets it appears so the, the burden falls on the government would you be prepared to subsidize affordable, quote unquote, affordable housing? I think that there are ways that we can partner with private developers to encourage them to invest in low income housing. It has been done before quite successfully. The whole of Portmore was built in that way and many other schemes were, have been built across the country in that way. You know, the government has significant land resources that can be put in as equity to help developers reduce their costs. There may be some uh, a way in which we can assist with infrastructure as well. So there must there may be some amount of public investment, yes. But but that should get um, you know, a return out of the proceeds of, of the of the project. The government, I think, has really dropped its hands though. When I asked Minister Clark in Parliament, or when Minister Clark was asked in Parliament about why the government is not trying to do more to encourage developers to build low-income houses, he said, oh, we've run ads twice, and but we haven't found any takers. And I thought, you know, that was to me a pathetic reply. You know, you need to get to bring them to the table and say, this is our strategy, and what will it take to, for us to collaborate and make it work? And you find solutions in that way. I'm sure it can be done because it's been done before very success, successfully. When has it been done before successfully? Give me an example. Well, look at the whole of Portmore, for example. How you know that's tens of thousands of houses that were built in that way, with um you know partnership with with uh, a private developer and the state using funds under the San Jose Accord at the time. You know there are ways that we these things can be done, and there are you know other other developments that have been built across the country in that way. All right, let me take some more questions from the audience. 
Chantel Clark. I feel like Chantel already asked the question. Anyway, Chantel says, what are you hoping to do differently from the JLP to reduce crime and violence? Should your group be reelected to office? Crime is always the number one issue. So, and it connects to the economy as well, as you pointed out earlier. So what's the crime plan, Mr. Goldie? I'm not saying there's any magic silver bullet to solving the problem of crime. It's been a long-term problem in the country. But the truth of the matter is that when the PNP was in government last, over those four years, we managed to reduce serious crime, in particular murders, significantly. And the average number of murders per year since we left office over the last eight years of the JLP has been roughly 25% higher than the average under the four years that we were in government. Now, how did we achieve that? We didn't achieve that by taking away people's rights. We didn't take, try and achieve that by using states of emergency or, or other you know, curfews excessively and so on. Rather, we took a holistic view of the matter and we had a balanced policy. And that's what we're going to return to, where we work with communities through the peace management initiative, through things like Unite for Change, where we try and ensure that in communities there are mechanisms to reduce tensions and the incentive or the capacity for reprisals. Reprisals are a major source of violence in the country. They need to be dealt with by proactively working with community influencers to up, so that small disputes don't become major things that generate a spiral of murders. That's what the Peace Management Initiative had been doing quite successfully. It, was, it has been defunded and denuded by this government. Unite for Change, again, was working with the churches, working with NGOs and so on, to try and give unattached, so-called unattached youth, youth at risk, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to get into formal productive um, endeavors, you know, whether it be get, ensuring that they have a TRN, that they have a birth certificate, that they, they're literate, that they have skills training, that they can, a way in which you can uh, provide them with some soft financing to get into business, all of those things. It, Project STAR, which is the current um, private sector initiative, is really modeled on Unite for Change. It's very similar. But Unite for Change was a state-sponsored program and was much more of a national program. The, the challenge with Project STAR is because of its limited resources, it can only touch on a few communities at a given point in time. That, so that's an important part of our crime management philosophy. Apart from that, we need to ensure that the police have the necessary tools to do their job. This government strategy has been really focusing on the military, the buildup of the military, the JDF. They've doubled the number, the size of the JDF, and a significant capital expenditure for the JDF, really at the expense of the JCF, especially in the 2017, 2018, 20, that period early on, when crime really got out of control. And, you know, that has been, in the recent year, last couple of years, I've been trying to make up that lost ground by trying to increase the numbers in the police force. But you see, the problem is when you have crime has reached a certain level, to get it back down is very challenging. So, you know, we feel that the, ensuring that the police are properly looked after, the necessary legislative changes are made. This government is really underperforming when it comes to legislative solutions to problems. Legislation really doesn't cost money to implement and to develop. It just requires diligence and creative thinking. And this government is lacking in that. So, for example, we've CIMA, the Crime Monitoring and Oversight Committee, which is a bipartisan um, mechanism with civil society involvement, trying to take a long-term view of how we solve the problems that create crime. There were deliverables in the MOU that created CIMA. There were deliverables that the government has not delivered on. An Enhanced Security Measures Act still hasn't come. Unexplained wealth orders as a tool for tackling corruption still hasn't come. There's no excuse for that. If we had been in government, those would have been in place long ago. So, you know, these are some of the areas that the government has really dropped the ball in terms of giving the law enforcement the necessary tools. And, we, you know, I, I'm a former justice minister, and I see the importance of the integration of justice and security in order to achieve certain goals. So, for example, case preparation within the police force is vital, ensuring that the police understand and are equipped to, to prepare cases for trial so that the necessary 
elements of the offense can be proved successfully and the prosecution doesn't collapse. We need to empower the police, integrate them with the office of the DPP in that regard, in terms of the a synergistic approach. It happens to some extent, but it needs to be deepened so that we have proper case preparation and case management coming out of the out of the police force. So these are some of the some of the tactics and strategies that we would employ and have worked in the past and need to be doubled up on and so that we can get our murder rate down from being one of the worst in the world to one which is much more tolerable. And of course, if we can also achieve our objectives in terms of the education problem and the problem of training and get our youth off of a pathway of destruction and badness and into productive citizenship, and that's why we will have a Ministry of Social Transformation focusing on how do we build a cohesive society, family values, you know, ensuring that single parent mothers and so on have the necessary support so that their mm -hmm. children are nurtured and, and can get through primary school, you know, and achieve, you know, literacy by the time they reach the secondary school. If I feel all like of the time children... is one of those issues that neither party has really been able to get right so far and yeah. make a major dent in and it just continues to get worse and worse each year regardless of initiatives that are put in but i want to move on to our well next i agree with that to an extent kalila but i think the data matters and the fact of the matter is that we perform significantly better in this area than the current government that 25 percent per annum lower murder rate translates to literally thousands of people who are, would be alive today had they not had been exposed to the higher murder rate under the current government. Mm. Our next question comes from Orain, who wants to know, does your government plan to put in place any legislation or laws to prevent an SSL-like scenario from happening in the future? Which I think is a great question because as you would know, the market has been destabilized since last year. The loss of investor confidence has resulted in dramatic losses on the stock exchange. And a lot of people who are watching this show right now uh, are invested and are seeing those losses continue to pile up. We recently saw the JSC managing director say we should expect another two years of losses. Two years. Uh, oh. So a lot of it's stemming yeah. from SSL, that loss of investor confidence. So how do we yeah. bring back investor confidence? And like Oreen asked, would you put in any legislation to prevent such a situation from happening again? Yeah, that's a great question, Oreen. The, the truth is that the, the demise of the stock exchange predated the SSL debacle, but the SSL debacle has compounded the problem. And in my view, it's a governance issue primarily. The FSC, I think, was not given the necessary strong independent board that was required to implement the regulatory regime which exists. We have a robust regulatory system in the country. The Financial Services Commission Act, the Securities Act, the Insurance Act, the Banking Services Act. These are all relatively modern pieces of legislation. They're not perfect and there are always things that can be done to improve them. And one is constantly looking at how what that can be done. But the real problem with SSL was that the regulator essentially dropped the ball. They did not follow through with the necessary measures of enforcement, which the law provided them. And why that was is still not clear to me. Why is it, for example, that the directions that they were had issued were essentially lifted when there was no basis for thinking that SSL had improved its performance? And, you know, some of the board appointments in the SSL, I don't want to get, I'm sorry, the board appointments at the FSC, the regulator, I don't want to get into dropping names and all that, but they were very suspect because the persons who were there had no experience in the financial sector and mm -hmm. didn't understand the way in which the, the risks that are inherent in the financial industry. That's an industry I'm very familiar with, Kalida. I have worked I in that industry for my whole career. And as a lawyer, I, you know, I was one of the architects of the FSC when the when the FSC w was being developed as a concept, I worked with Brian Winter and others to do that uh, and help to put in place that legislation. And it has worked well. And if you look up, if you look at it, we've re had relatively few problems. We've had very few insolvencies and so on. We, we went through the 2007, 8, 9 financial, international financial crisis without any crisis in our domestic market. And that's good. This SSL thing was a peculiar thing. 
for one, the company is known to have close links with the government. We, that is well known. The prime minister had his accounts there and pulled them shortly before the thing came. You know what hit the fan. The way in which the regulator was dealt with, the changes that were made at the board level, and then what happened after that in terms of the regulator essentially dropping its hand, that was also very problematic. I am hoping that the, the, this matter will be properly investigated. I'm very concerned that we're not getting regular reports from the powers that be that are investigating the crimes that took place there to keep the country abreast of what is happening. We, do, we heard the FBI were involved. We heard about some firm out of England from forensic auditors. You know, no doubt very expensive. What are they delivering on? I don't know. But that we may have to have a commission of inquiry looking at the SSLs oh. because I'm I feel that I feel that there's lessons, important lessons that need to be learned about what happened, but which allowed that to take place. Because as you said, it has really undermined not just local investors but Jamaicans abroad as well mm -hmm. who are seeing this and they feel, wow, how can this just happen? Where you know the track the track icon of the 21st century, Usain Bolt, has lost you know, substantial savings that he put in there for his parents' pension. You know, it is a problem and it needs to be looked at. But I think the system and the laws are not the main problem there. It was the way in which the regulator operated and the fact that this entity was allowed to go on for far too long without the necessary measures being put in place by the regulators and using the ladder of enforcement, which is in the law, uh, to ensure that investors were protected. So should heads have ruled at the FSC? I think that there needs to be a serious look at that and uh, as to what, you know, what took place. I think that there have been changes. Uh, as you know, the Bank of Jamaica is essentially running the FSC now. The person in charge at FSC is a Bank of Jamaica operative now. So, you know, there have been changes, but it's too late. It's after the crisis that are already, already crystallized. What would a commission of inquiry accomplish? Well, we had a FinSAC Commission of Inquiry. Mm -hmm. Over $100 million was it, was spent. And uh, they've never delivered. we can't get a report. <laughs> and we can't get a report out of it, which is a disgrace. Another disgrace. Which is why I ask, what would a Commission of yeah. Inquiry accomplish? I think that Commissions of Inquiry can be successful in looking in depth at the problem and at delivering a report with recommendations. For example, after the West Kingston incursion of 2010, you know, we undertook a commission of inquiry and we brought in a steam judge from Barbados to chair it and two other eminent persons and they they were able to complete their work and deliver a report which basically looked at the whole issue um some of those some of their recommendations have not yet been implemented but some have and you know I think that it's an example of how a commission of inquiry can function can operate within its budget and develop and deliver a report which is a meaningful report it's a question of management. I don't know what happened with the FinSAC one. I don't think that that was a mismanaged situation. It was botched by the then Minister of Finance. And it's a real scandal that you, the government could have spent over $100 million and have no report to show for it. So it's And of course, it's tragic because it was an important episode in the history of Jamaica. And there are a lot of strong views held as to why what happened and why. And it's important that we get to the truth because it's often the subject of all kinds of rhetoric and propaganda. And, and you know, I think what the truth needs to come out as to what were the causes, what were the measures, why did why did things that come into exist, existence and what did it do and so on. So it's an important thing. But I don't think you can have something like SSL that just go past, go by the wayside, no accountability, nobody's brought to book, nobody really knows what took place. The Minister of Finance received reports, they were in his cupboard, he didn't act on them. He's not been held accountable for that. You no, know, we need to get to the truth of it, and we need to have it done in a proper, transparent, and independent way. So I would be in favor of that. Um, you know, when when we are in office. Wow. All right. So we're coming up upon time, but I do have to ask you this: There's been widespread speculations that there will be an election called this year. How confident are you, given that you're currently behind in the polls? Not you personally. I mean, the party's currently behind in the polls. How I don't know which poll are you're referring to. We're ahead in the polls. Oh. We're three percent ahead in the polls. Maybe and, I'm maybe um, I'm looking at maybe I'm late with the numbers. Sorry. Yeah, me. yeah. We've been ahead in the polls for. We I think we first we drew level with the government February last year, 
And um, in June, we were ahead, and in September, we were ahead, and in, in, and in the poll that some private businessmen procured, um, which was published in December, we're 3% ahead. So we're confident, actually, and my confidence continues to grow every time I go on the road and every time I see and hear from people in the street who are absolutely fed up with the corruption, they're fed up with a government that they think doesn't care for them, they're fed up of living in fear with no real crime plan for dealing with the situation. And yes, you know, the, the macro economy is fine and the credit rating agencies are happy, but that is not translating into meaningful benefits for the people. And that is a problem for the government. And I don't think they know how to solve it. So I'm actually quite confident that in the next election, the People's National Party will prevail. Okay, now I see what I was looking at. I was looking at parish council internal. Right. But what we're more concerned yeah. at this moment for me, I'm looking at mm -hmm. the national picture since the buzz is about general elections possibly being yeah. called this year. Yeah. Uh, well, all the best when the time comes, Mr. Golding. Uh, we'll see you on the campaign trail, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you very much for having me, Kalila, and keep up the excellent work of educating people about business and finance. I think that, you know, I'm very impressed with what you've been able to deliver in, in this, you know, developing this portal and this show on your own. I remember, I know a little bit about where you're coming from and, you know, keep up the good work. I think that is it. You. what you have developed is a unique product and people, I think, are, are benefiting from it and enjoying it. So God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you for making the time to come. Uh, PMP and opposition leader Mark Golding.